What is your full name, sir? George Christian Brueggemann. Where and when were you born? I was born on the island of the Celebes, Macassar, on Monday, 1923. What date? Monday. 1923. What month and day? The month is April. Monday, 1923. What, April 1st, 2nd? April 23, 23rd. So how old are you right now? 94 years old. Do you feel like you're 94? No. How old do you feel? Oh, I would say around 90, 89. What service were you in during World War II? I was and the Royal Dutch Indies Army. And what was your role? What was what? What was your job in the Royal Dutch East Indies Army? I had to drive a motorcycle from one post to the other with orders. Were you also trained as a rifleman? Oh, yes. ROTC, when I, when I turned 18. So can you tell me the specific units that you were attached to? Infantry. The infantry. But what were the numbers of the units? I don't remember anymore. <clears throat> Were you in a company or a regiment or a division? In a company. In a company. And it was made up of only Dutch nationals? Dutch nationals. Only Dutch nationals. And Ambonese people that were only that are only in the Dutch East Indy land. So, what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? Corporal. And were you ever a prisoner of war? Yes, for three and a half years. At the island of Fukuoka in Japan, where we have to work on a shipyard, building ships for Japan that they used for the war. How long did, you, did the Dutch East Indies Army fight the Japanese before they were captured? Well, when the war broke out, the, on the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked, it was on a breakfast morning that we got the news on the radio that our queen declared Japan the war. So I assume we were, our queen was the first that did de declare the war to Japan. The Netherlands supposed to be the first land. Because we are, we are allies with the United, with the United States. So the next day, we had to report for duty. 
And that's when the infiltration after a few days started. The first fight was kind of weird since you never have shot a person. You never try to kill a person. But then after the first one, you have one thing in mind. Kill or be killed. So, we have fought several days in inland in the hills, and I've been driving from one post to the other post with commands. And one day, I was driving up to one post when my captain came out under his cover and aimed his gun in the air. When a plane came in my direction, I couldn't hear it because the sound of the motorbike. But when I look up, I saw the plane diving down, open fire on me. I hear the bullets flying around. And I had one thing in mind, I had to get off. I jumped off the motorbike, which was on about 35, 40 miles speed, to the ditch. And had one thing that I could remember. God help me. And believe it or not, after all that, I came out with not one scratch. That is when I really start to believe that if you ask him and really believe in him, everything will come right. Because he's created us and he has the power and the love to handle what he needs to handle for us. And since then, <clears throat> I always have my life, a long life, there's a lot of trouble to go through it, have been able to overcome all these troubles. I have six children, 17 grandchildren, 25 great-grandchildren, and four great-great-grandchildren. And feel myself as a very lucky man. I have to leave Indonesia in 1987 to move to the Netherlands because Indonesia did get their independence. And all the Dutch people that do not want to change their nationality start to be boycotted. And thinking about my children, I don't see any future for them if I stay longer in that country. So I went back to the, I went to the Netherlands where I spent two years working on a Steve Doring company. And I had a very hard time to get used to it because we have not been really accepted, accepted as Dutch since we are having a different skin color. So I decided for the future of my children that I have to go to the United States of America 
and start a new life, which I did and arrived in Dayton, Ohio in 1960. By working as much as I can, I've been able to reach of what I have now. I'm very grateful for it, to have gone through all this, on, uh, with all the trouble that we had going through, but I'm very happy about it. Because my children, my whole family, are well off, and that was, has been my goal in my life. Tell me about Tell me about growing up in Indonesia. As a small child, what kind of things would you do for fun? What I have done, my hobby, what I love the most is fishing and hunting and soccer. Those are my hobbies. And I had done many, many crazy things. I did have a dance school. I had, I had, had a band. So I did very many different things in my life that I really have enjoyed and have very good memories of that. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I do have three brothers and three sisters. Did any of your brothers serve in the military? Uh, not during the war. What was your father's profession? He has been working for the bank. You know, during the worldwide Great Depression, was Indonesia affected? Very much. Very much. What do you remember about that? Well, I still remember. I still remember that at one time, the money has to be cut up in two. All the dollars, all the gold money, all the paper money need to be cut in two. So we lost half of their value. They would literally cut it? Yes. Yeah, they just have to be cut it. But it did not have affected us too many because my father did have a coconut plantation uh, beside that, a fish farm which he had beside his job. The Dutch nationals and the native Indonesians, did they get along? Before the war, very much, because our life by that time, before the war, has been very easy. I remember we do have four servants working for us. They live in a house and room behind our house. We have somebody to do the house cleaning, somebody to do the washing, somebody do the cooking, some, per some person that walk our kids when I was a kid to the school and pick us up from the school. And all their family, all the children of our servants, 
that grew up right beside us up to their certain age, 16, 17 years old, before they start their own life. What did you want to do with your life before the war? I really didn't have much of an uh, interest in anything yet. All I want is to have a family that I can bring up and have a good marriage and life, which I think I have accomplished. Why did you join the ROTC? When we went at, at high, when we were at high school, when you reach 18 years, then you had to go to like an ROTC, a training that is two times, two months, uh, two times in a month. That's mandatory. That is that was mandatory For because the... because I think they already expected that something is going on. Was it mandatory only for the Dutch or all Indonesians? Only for the Dutch people and the Indonesian people that are at high school can enjoy it or can join it if they want to, but it is, that was not a must for them. Um, when you were in Indonesia, did you speak primarily Dutch or English? Dutch. The only English that I have learned that was in my senior years as uh, in my senior years. How do you say hello, how are you in Dutch? Hello, who had it met you? If you ask that to an older people, you say, hello, who had it met you? That is the respect for older people, of strangers. So how did you end up getting into the Dutch East Army's army? How did you end up in the Dutch East Indies army? When I turned, uh, when the war broke out, when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese, the next day we have to report for duty. And that is when I started my life in the army. Did they train you then? What, in the time before the infiltration, we did, they did train us, but that was a very, very short time. Talk to me about the training you received. Shooting and whatever you have to do as a soldier. What was the strategic importance of Indonesia? Why would the Japanese invade Indonesia? Japan is north from the Philippines. I think what they try to do they tried to get to Australia and then to America, but they had to go to the Philippines. They had to go to New Guinea, what is half of Indonesia, half part of Indonesia. They had to go to Indonesia, and then they go south to Australia. Did you ever go to Australia? Never. Not as a kid? 
Never. Most people who grew up in the Dutch East Indies, did the Dutch nationals, did they ever go back to the Netherlands? Not very many. Because they did have too good a life in Indonesia. Do you remember any of the Japanese air attacks? In Indonesia, not very many. Because we have been, we have been fighting in the hills, in the jungle, and really didn't have many attacks out in the jungle or in the mountains. The, the, the Dutch East Indies Army, is that similar to a National Guard? No, not really. It's, it's an army. The National Guard are mostly for the older people that are too old to serve. If they are 40 years, around 38, 40 years, then they have something like a National Guard for them. So, what, what kind of weapon were you carrying in combat? The old style, long rifles with long, <clears throat> with long bayonets. They do not have the weapons, but they do not have the weapons that they are fighting with now. You have a long rifle and a bayonet to fight with. The Dutch East Indies Army, what was it well organized? Very well organized. Talk to me about the structure. The Can you tell me about the structure? Well, we, we have about this, like the 18 years and up to young, the younger people, they, they call it the Malisi, Malisi, okay? And when you get older, then it's just a regular army. Did you all wear the same uniform? We all have the same uniform. Describe to me uh, what kind of... What did your combat uniform look like? That is kind of green, grayish, grayish green, and grayish uh, wrapping around your legs. Leggings? Leggings, yes. What, what kind of boots did you have? Regular combat boots. And your helmets, were they like the British helmets? No, we have the, the, the Dutch helmets, like more like them. It looks similar to the, uh, similar to the American helmets nowadays. How would you guys get most of your news? Is it what was it? Did you hear about the Japanese invasion through the radio or the paper? Through the radio. That we did hear the war being through the radio on the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked, and I think it was about eight between eight and nine o'clock in the morning, Indonesian time. When you heard that Pearl Harbor was attacked, did you know that something was going to happen to Indonesia? Yes, because right then, through the radio, we get the news that the Queen from the Netherlands declared the war to Japan. When you were growing up, did you hear 
about what Japan was doing to China? The rape of Nanking? No. Because when we are in any army, it has been too many days before Japan infiltrated Indonesia. Was there a large Japanese population in Indonesia? Yes. We have Japanese stores in Indonesia. Okay. But I think before that, there was already something taught by the Dutch that something is going on. I don't know how and why, but they were kind of starting to think doing things before something is going to happen. Even though you lived in Indonesia, were you, uh, were most people, most the Dutch nationals, were you very patriotic? We are, we are very, because to us, the queen is our mother. You know. So, what day did the Japanese physically invade Indonesia? No, I do not know exactly the day because it should be not too long, not too long before they came because we have to blow up several sta gas stations so that they could not get to gasoline and several big buildings that they could use, everything what they could use, we blew up before we pulled back into the jungle and to the hills and the mountains. So, I think it, it must be Several, several weeks after the infiltration that we know that they are landed. Talk to me about your first experience in combat. Well, as I said before, it's kind of hard to think to kill a person that you do not know and never have been killing before. It's a weird feeling, but then one thing comes in mind. If you do not kill, you will be killed. And so you know that your family, your friends have been killed by them. The feeling of feeling sorry is gone, but the feeling of hate is there. Which has been through the whole war and after the war. But if you get older, and you do think back, you know it has been senseless. It was no need for, we are all the same. No matter who you are, what color you are, what religion you are, we are all the same. It makes no any difference. They have only one creator. That's the way I did feel, and that's the way I hope that most people are feeling the way when they are getting older. There is no, if you look around, there is no love the way it's supposed to be in this world. 
and I do hate very much to see the future for children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and anybody that came that are coming after us. The only thing that I regret is that my children and my family could not have the experience that I did have in my life when I grew up in Indonesia. Can you talk to me uh, about Your first time taking on enemy fire, where were you, what happened? I was on the motorbike from one post to the other post when I was fired on by a plane that was diving, was diving in my direction. So. What about the first time you took on fire from the infantry, the Japanese infantry? Do you remember the first time you took on fire from them? Yes. I remember that. You try to stay, try to get cover and fire back on them. You know. The fighting that you did was it all in the jungle? Most of it in the jungle. Because I, be, I have been spending a lot of time on the road going from one post to the other post with com commands from the officers. Because way back, we do, we do not have, uh, how you call it? Radio. We do not have radio on the field. We do not have walkie-talkies on the field. It is mostly mouth to mouth, from one post to the other post. And that has been what most of my work has been. But I remember I was up, up on the side of one hill and I could see down on the side of an other hill where a company was a company was surrounded and attacked by the Japanese. And that section from that company was completely wiped out by the Japanese. But from the place where I was on the other side, I had plenty of time shooting on the Japs. And later I found out that a younger uncle of mine that was the youngest son of my grandmother was killed in that section. The younger brother of my father was killed a few days well, a few days after they were fighting in the jungle. He was hit by a grenade grenade shell and split his head open. I hear it the day after because they didn't have, when he passed by in the truck. I saw a pair of boots sticking out in the back, but nobody wanted to say anything until the next day that it was my uncle. When you heard that your uncle was killed, what was that like? It drove me crazy. It drove me crazy. I said that. One thing in mind, kill, kill, kill whenever you can. But if, if you were a messenger on the motorbike, 
Did you have a lot of opportunity to fire at the Japanese? Not very many opportunities. I had to be just in the neighborhood where the fighting is. Just in the neighborhood where the fighting is. You know. <clears throat> but w were there times that you were able to fire at the Japanese? That I were fired at the Japanese? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did it feel better? You know, after what they did to your uncle? I mean, did that make you feel better? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> because hate, hate, not even my uncle, my friends, my school buddies, families, like nephews, cousins, you know. You know, you don't know where they are, you don't know where they're still alive or when they're gone. Your schoolmates, you don't know whether they're still living or gone. Every night, you only have one thing in mind. Will I make tomorrow night? Because you do not know what the day of tomorrow was was going to be. Most of us at night when we get the chance and there was booze around, we try to boost it up to forget things. Would you try to forget? What is going to be the next day? What is going to happen the next day? Am I still going to back, be back the next day among my friends that are still alive? No. When did the Japanese capture you? That was um, in May of 1942. This is the way it went. The main army of the main island of Java has been capitulating already. And we were still fighting. They could not get us down until they came with an ultimatum. You surrender or we are going to take you out on the camps where the older people, where the women and the children are. That was their ultimation. Surrender or what? Or we taken out. Oh, they will kill them. They will kill our family. Older people, women, children. Women and children. So what is left for us? Sure. Nothing. Because that is what we have been fighting for. That's the way they get us to surrender because they did have a very hard time on the island where we were fighting. So, so I, I stay in the camp after I was prisoner of war till October in 1942 when I was one of the guys that had been picked out to be sent to Japan on the Asama Maru. It was about 800 people from the camp where we were. And in Japan, they put us in a big camp that consists of uh, 
all together maybe because we ha they have also prisoners from Australia, from England that came later than us. So the camp consists out about 1,200, 1,500 people. It was a mix, and that's where I where I had picking up some English from the English British British people, American people, Australian people. Tell me about the ship that they put you on. The Samamaru is a big troop ship. I think that that ship would oh, take about 1,200, 1,500 people. Did they cram you in the hole? Oh, yes. They did cram us in the hole. Right on the, on the bottom side of the boat. On the floor. On the deck. <clears throat> How long were you in there? Oh, I would say... It took us about eight or, eight or nine days to get from Vivert to Japan. Talk to me about what it was like in the hold of the ship. Terrible. Describe it to me. Very crowded. Mostly you have sitting or leaning back to sleep. And we went, in, when we got in, in uh, Fukuoka too, where we had been stationed, there barracks. What would wouldn't some of the men die in the hold of the ship? No. No one died. No one died. What would they do to let you use the restroom? What they do what? How would you use the restroom? trying to take turns and waiting for each other. And you can imagine how hard that is, how hard that has been with so many people. So, so, so they didn't give you a bucket? No. On, okay, so, you, so on some of the ships, the yeah. Japanese, they would give them a bucket. Yeah, yeah. But to, they didn't do that. They let you use a restroom. If, if they have place for people to go, because there are so many people, you know. So whatever they can have, buckets or something, you can do that. It's that you can do it in it. What did What did you do? I just to do the bucket. Hmm? I I just used the bucket to do it. But where would you put it then? Have to take it over there. When there is an opening to, when there is an opening to put it in, then you go over there and throw it in there. What would they give you food-wise on the ship? A ball the size of a tennis ball. That is your lunch. Ball of what? Rice. And the same thing for the evening, a ball of rice. Now, when you were fighting the Japanese, had you heard about how brutal they were? Yes. What did you hear about them? But I hear that some of the people, some of the people that they kill, they kill the penis, they cut the penis off, you know, or they cut their face or chest open while they are dead already. What for? Or when they're wounded and die. I, I know you were a messenger, yeah? Yeah. But were you ever in a situation where you and some other soldiers yeah. were fighting against a Japanese group. Oh yeah. Like a firefight. 
Yeah. So were there times that men around you were getting hit? Other Dutch? Oh, yes. Yes. Talk to me about what that's like. Very bad. Very bad. But then you start thinking, you start thinking, when is it my turn? Did you ever have to provide first aid? No. Uh -uh. Because they have people running around. Talk to me about the kind of supplies that the Dutch, the East, yeah, the Dutch East Indies Army. Yeah. Were you well supplied or were you, did you lack a lot of supplies? We lack a lot of supplies. Like what? Like food. We, we have to try to get, we have to try to find something to eat. Even water sometimes. When you are in the mountains, there's no water in the mountain, but just puddle, little puddles from rainwater, while the animals are coming to drink and to pee and poop in it. And some of that we have to drink since did you drink that? Yes. Yes, and I think why and how many of us have not had any problem with it because the sun, the heat from the sun that hit the water, the water is so hot that all the bacteria will go down on the bottom. See what I mean? Will sink down to the bottom of the poodles. So we just try to get the sip of the top of the poodles to cleanse our thirst. I remember one time we came up we came up to a little stream and everybody was trying trying to run to it to get some water. Then and that one of those lieutenants get the nerve to tell the people that not belong to his company to wait their turn. We have been so mad that it has not been much of a problem for somebody to put a bullet in his head. It was that bad. They killed him? No, I, that, that somebody would have in his mind to put a bullet in his head because they had so lack of water that they hardly couldn't take it anymore. That he had the nerve to say, no, wait till my man has been drinking. When you were fighting the Japanese, you mentioned, you know, it was in the jungle, but you also mentioned mountains. It, it's very, the mountains are all jungle, right? Yeah. So what's it like to fight the enemy in a jungle? Well, you, you hear from the natives where they are, from where, which side they are coming from. And then you try to cut them off. Because you, you know then where to expect them. You know where to expect them to come. That, that's the way they find out. Because the, the natives are still not know what Japanese are, but they are very, but they are very loyal to Dutch people because they always have been treated right. And they always have 
very much respect for the Dutch people. Because they know that they did have a good life. The farmers, if they start to farm, start to farm, they need money. So we provide, who provided the money for them to start to work on the farm? The Dutch people, the banks. And they are all aware of that. When you, when you were fighting the Japanese, what would you say, what was the closest you came to the Japanese infantry? Not very close because I usually <clears throat> start fighting, when I start firing when I was on a distance from them. I do not start running into them, you know. Now, uh, but, but give me an idea, how, 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 the closest, how close was it? Was it? Oh, I would say, I don't wait, I used the between 60 and 80 yards. And was that when you were at the high point and you... Oh, that was a fat farther. That was about 300, 350, 400 yards. Oh, when you were at the far point? Yeah. But are you still accurate at that far away? No, I don't know. All I, see, I, I can see what is Japanese and what is that because of that cap, that uniform, see? That's what I'm looking for, and that's what I shoot, that's what I shoot at. So, did you ever come across any Japanese tanks? No, uh-uh. Did you? I, I know that we didn't have anything, that they have, that they have them there, they didn't know have, have anything, <clears throat> to fight them with, but they use uh, bottles with fume, gasoline and stuff that, and they wait. When they combine, they throw it inside. You saw that? No, I, I know that they do it. I haven't seen it, but I know that that's what they've been doing. To blow them up. The Japanese, they would booby trap. Did uh, you ever come across the booby? No. Did you ever go souvenir hunting? No, never. Did you see guys who did? Mm -mm. To find things on the underground? From the Japanese? From the Japanese, no. Like their flag or their samurai mm -mm. sword? No. What kind of messages are you taking between the officers? Well, what they have to do to pull back, to go west, to go east, where the enemy is coming from. Okay. Those kind of messages. What they have to move to, how far they have to move to. You know. So when you heard, when you decided that you were going to let the Japanese capture you. Where did you go? Uh, they asked us to go to a place, a place, Majene, Majene. And that's why they want us all to go and give up. So, so the officer told us, well, we have to go over there to surrender. And then the Japanese came? Yes. And what did they do to you all when they first came? I think they all line, line us up and then they put us all together and took us to the army camp that, you, that, that we used to use, to our army camp, and put us in there, see, and have their soldiers around the camp to watch us.
talk to me about being a, a prisoner of war. What was that like in that camp? Well, kind of terrible because if they really want, if they really want to punish you, they take a, a rod. They take a rod. They let you uh, let you sit down on your knee, kneel down, and put the rod behind your knees and sit on your butt. Did you ever feel what that feels like? You have to sit like that with the heat signing on you, the sun signing on you. That is one of the punishment. Of that half a piece of rope, what they use, the big manila rope, what they use for the boats, to tie the boats on, about three foot long, four foot long. They make it wet to put some weight on it, and they hit the hell out of you. That is one. That is that is one of the punishment. The way to punish you, if you don't do what they want, and it's hard because you don't understand them. So what I have been trying from the beginning to understand the language, and that that was a help in Japan too. Because if you understand their language, you know what they want. If you do, if you do not know what they want, they smack you right in your they smack you right in your face. Were you ever punished? Uh, I have several slaps on my face. <laughs> But never, never punished with the uh, rope. I had sitting on my butt with a stick in between my, my you, you thigh and my, yeah, behind my knee. And it was very painful. How long did they keep you like that? Uh, about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. But it, it seemed like a very, very long time at that time. From the camp? The army camp in Indonesia yeah. that they first put you in, did anyone try to escape? No, because we were surrounded all over with guards. From any of the camps that you went to, did anyone ever try to escape? No. <clears throat> when you got to Japan, what was the, the labor that they had you do? Building ships. They train us, riveting, drilling, plating, everything what they need to build ships. We have learned a lot, I have, to, I have to admit that, you know. Did they treat you okay in Japan? No. The same thing in the morning for breakfast. You got, they call it soup, but it, it, it looks like this water. <laughs> it looks like this water, not much taste out of nothing. No, and when you go to, you, to the wharf, wharf to work, you got a sardine can with rice, and a little piece of dried fish or a little piece of dried vegetables on it. That was your lunch. And when you come home from work at night, the same thing, one bowl of rice, sauce that I call soup, and a little vegetable or a little fish. That, is, that was your dinner. That was your dinner. But one thing I have to say, 
Some of the Japanese, especially Japanese women that has working also at the shipyard, are, are smuggling, are trying to smuggle some food for us, like, like a fruit or tomato, and smuggling it in for us. But when they get caught, they were ge beating the hell out like they would, they would beat a man. And some of them, after a few days of work because of the pain that they have suffered, they start smuggling again. So I have to admit, there, there are people among them with feelings, the natives, not the soldiers or the sailors, but the natives. And when you think back, their husband, their father of their son has been killed. Why? What for? Then you get different feelings in your head. Why? Why should that be that way? People that never have experienced it, I bet you they all have the same feelings. Why did I do that? Why do I have to do that? You know? It's a long time before they get over that feeling. A very, very long time. And taking the dead people like my cousin die, and some of my friends from school die, taking them from the island where the shipyard is, to the place where they have to be burned up. See, they don't bury them. They don't bury the dead people, you know. They cremated them. So you had to bring them? Yes, on the ferry boat. But what were you doing on the ferry boat? Well, do you go with them. They, are, they allow six or eight people to take the dead people on the ferry boat to Nagasaki. Okay. Nagasaki, Japan? Yeah. Uh, but your uncle was killed in Indonesia. No, he was already dead. Yeah. But I have a cousin that died in Japan. See? Oh, he, how did your cousin die? Sickness. Because they don't have any medication practically for the prisoners of war. I, I did have, he, well, he really is not, a, I would say, a, I might be wrong saying, not a fighter. If you are sick, you hardly get any, any food that you want to eat, okay? And when you're too sick to eat, what happens? You lose everything. If you don't, if you cannot eat several days, weeks, you cannot eat, and don't have anything in, in your system to fight the sickness, you die. You know? People think it's a, a, a weird thing to think about, but food is a very important thing for life. They get sick, they throw up, they get sick, they throw up, and they, they, they don't want to eat anymore. I had two times, I had two times pneumonia in there. But whatever they give me to eat, no matter how bad I feel, how worse it is, I keep, I eat and throw up, eat and throw up, eat and throw up. That went me to all the pain and sickness, I came out of it. 
But my cousin didn't have the will. And I think that that was the reason. He was too weak to keep on going. But was he working in the same shipyard as you? Yes. So it's only a coincidence that you were both there. Oh yeah. Yeah, because he came from the same from the same city where I was. See? The, the, all these people that went to Japan on that boat are people that are in our big company in the army. So he was from in your company? Yeah. And so what was his name? Albert. A L B E R T. Albert. Albert. How old was he? Oh, Albert was born at that time. I would say 23, 24 years old. And how old was your uncle? My uncle, my my dad's younger brother, uh, was around 38 or 39. Okay. So you're saying, what? Would, tell me about the ferry. Where would you... You, you you helped with the bodies to cremate them. Yeah, we had... We, Did you volunteer for that, or they told you to do that? No, they asked. They, they know you're a relative or a very good friend, you know. And they asked so many people to go, to bring someone to, to be cremated. So, I went. So, so where did they... Where did you go from, and where did you go to? From the island that we were, from Fukuoka to, so. To where? To where he's supposed to be cremated. That is approximately uh, 40, 40, 45 minutes from where I was, from where the camp was. What do you remember about the cremation? We just drop them off there. We don't stay there. We just take them and bring them over there. From the ferry to the place where, where they are cremated. What was that like for you to bring your own cousin? He is dead. What else? It's just like over here when you bring somebody you love to the graveyard. That's what this all it was. The people, the, the, the civilians back in Indonesia, your family, yeah. how were they being treated by the Japanese who were there? They were being treated very bad. Now the young people, the young generation have been trained by the Japanese. Uh, communism started at that time. Communism started. Communism already was going on on the island of Java, the main island. And it went over to the other islands, Sukarno. So that battle started and went over to the island where I was. And they inf uh, get on the younger generation over there. Should oh, as a young kid, you get a, a, a gun in your hand. It is macho, right? You get the training like a mil mil military. It's macho. So the younger generation is getting attracted to that. And then the communists get into that. And that has been that what is causing that whatever is that has to be boycotted unless you want unless you are willing to change your nationality, then you're okay. Then you're okay. But otherwise, they do everything to make life miserable for you. 
when you were at the shipyards, would, would, would uh, the prisoners try to sabotage in any way? Try to what? Stop? Sabotage the ship? Oh, yes. What would you do to sabotage the ship? If you are, if you are a riveter, okay, a plate, two plates need to be riveted against each other, see, and you get your riveted hammer, you have to rivet straight, and then later they come, the controller come and tap on the rivet, tap on the rivet, and he can hear with the sound if it's okay. But if one, some plate has so many rivets, he is not done in a couple of days to rivet the plate up and down and sideways. You know, so someone he hit, someone he didn't hit. So if you got your effort in it and you put the gun in an angle, that the whole effort don't go straight, in, but bent, you know, that cause, if the much movement on the ship, that caused the effort to fall off. And if you have it on several places on the plate, that is boycotting them. You know, so whatever we can think about to make the the boats that we're building not hundred percent safe, safe we are using that we do that. What well, what else would you do to sabotage besides the rivet? Well. On the outside, you work on you work on boards, on boards, okay. And you have things that rest on, right? And you you are on the inside. All people are working on the inside, and we see uh, people do, that you don't like from their side. We try to sabotage. To beat from the inside those bolts out outside, so that these boards that they're standing on is sliding and they're falling off of it. The Japanese people that are on the outside working on the outside. Well, that what we try to do. We try to do what we can do to make bad miserable for them, to make life miserable for them. Were, were there any, uh, now when you were working at the shipyard, was it only Dutch prisoners or there were no. other? No, Korean, Japanese people, they're all there. Americans? Amer oh yeah, American, Australian, British. Were there, was there ever, were there some people you know, some of the prisoners, did they ever become traitors and work with the Japanese? No. You never saw that? No. Mm -mm. I remember one American that was working in the refugee group, and he hated it. He hated it so much that one day he said, I have enough. He had his rifter hammer, hammer in his head. It's a tall guy. He sent up and he threw that hammer on his foot just to get off work. He broke this whole thing up. He had been he had been off work several weeks. I know his name is Matthew. I don't remember his last name. But he got to the point that he said he rather do that to be laid off to for so many days, so many weeks. When you were fighting the Japanese, 
Were you fighting them on the same island that you grew up on or yes. a different island? Not on the same island. Because there are so many different places, little cities, you know, and they're all infiltrated with Japanese, you know. <clears throat> so when you were fighting the Japanese, most of your fights with them, how far away from your home was that? 20 miles, 30 miles? Uh, like Chamba in the hills. It's about 80, 90 miles away. Did the Japanese... Um, they, they start, when they started, they were about... When they started infiltrating, the first time the fighting was about uh, five kilo, kilometers. So I would say about five or five or six miles from the city where we had the first uh, the first fight, five or six miles. They, they came out from the river, they went to the cornfield and they start coming out from the cornfield and that's where we used the, uh, the, the firing arm to mow them down, but the ones that fall down, they just step over it and keep on coming. They would step over what? Over the dead bodies from them. Because we're using them when they came under the, from the cornfield, coming out on the open field, the machine guns. So plum, 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 they just go over and keep on coming. That was a Banzai charge. Yeah. Did, did those charges happen a lot? Well, that was the first time that we had the first fight with them, you know. And that was like approximately 10, 10 miles from the city. Eight or ten miles from the city. But that was the first, the first fight that we did have there. Because if you, if you are shooting in a big, you see a big group, all their, you know, all their heads, and on that distance, you hit, you should hit, you cannot miss. So you feel like you've definitely hit? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I was, I, I'm good in shooting because I'm a big hunter, you know? Where would you aim? I'm a head, shoulders, Whatever is sticking out, that's what I'm shooting at. And, and the rifle that you, you have, how many rounds does it carry in a clip? <clears throat> in a clip is five. Five? Five in a clip, but you have that thing around your waist. The bandolier. Yeah, bandolier, yeah, see. And you have about 20 of those in here. Now, when you can speak a lot of different languages. Yeah. What language do you think in? When? That time? Right now. English language because I have been away from my country where I was born since 1957. And nobody hardly remember how to speak these languages in Indonesia. Malaysian, Malaysian language is about the main language in the big cities, Malaysian. But my grandmother came, Buginis is the Buginis people. Salayar is the Salayar people. Toraja is the Toraja people. Makassar is the Makassar people. But, but, I mean, you used to think in Dutch, right? No, I was thinking that, yeah, but, that's an English. No, but back then, you, you knew multiple different languages. Yeah, that's... But, but what, what, what language would you think in? There? Well, over here or there? No, back then, when you, yeah. were, when you were a kid. Dutch. 
We speaking that from childhood so or that's what you were thinking as well? Yeah, thinking also in that. Oh. How would you pass the time in Japan? How would you pass the time in the camp? Different times we are. If we don't have anything to do, we are boxing. In the camp? In the camp. The Japanese love it. Especially if you beat somebody up. Oh, Joto, Joto. They say, oh, good, good, good. You fight the Japanese? Or no, you... oh, our own people. <laughs> Did you ever do it? Oh, yes. Did you ever lose? Yes. <laughs> but why would you waste your energy on hitting? Well, yeah, have nothing else to do. You cannot sit the whole day on a day off. You exercise. Now, the shipyards were on the coast, right? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. How far away was the camp from the shipyard? From the shipyard, I would say... We walk about 15 minutes from the camp to the shipyard. Oh, so you would walk? Yeah, we walk to the shipyard. Would they have guards? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Before we go to the shipyard, we stand in line, and we have to call our number off. I still remember my number is, my number is 784. They don't call you by name, they don't you know if you know your name. But you have to know your number, because your number is after you go. Did they uh, ever try to speak to, to you in English? or you? No. So uh, how... Most of the time that are in my side of the barracks are Dutch people. Dutch people from Indonesia, see. On the other side are British. Australian and... But, but, but how would you communicate with the guards? Try to understand them. As you do, do this and you... Oh. Uh, and they feel... Oh, bakara! Bakara means crazy if you don't understand them, you know. Are the Indonesian natives, are they fighting alongside the Dutch? The, the, we have Indonesian native soldiers in the Dutch army. They have been trained. Were they good soldiers? Yeah, they are good soldiers. And some, some of these people, as I said, from one of the islands, we call them Ambonese people. Ambonese, they came from the island of Amborn. And they are very, very, uh, well, what you know, the queen to them, their queen from the Netherlands, the queen from the Netherlands, they call her their mother. They are so very pro Dutch that you won't believe what I have seen when they're fighting in the streets because they were fighting in the streets against the communist people, you know, and some when they were fighting. If they killed somebody, They swipe the blood and lick it. When was this? Indonesia, when the poli political action started, the communists started. That was after the war. After the war, you know. But they are, they are soldiers 100% for the Dutch. When you were fighting the Japanese on the ground? Yeah. 
did the Japanese use any artillery? Oh yeah. What do you remember about the artillery? Well, I I hear them and I see the explosions, you know. I see where they come down and where they exploded, but I was too far off of them to really see it from close by. What about the Japanese mortars? Mortars, yeah. That that's a one of the things that hit my dad's youngest brother, young, youngest brother. I thought it was a grenade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great form of mortar, explosion. You know, the, 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 the shoot off. Didn't you see the atomic bomb drop? After it had been dropped, we, we seen the, the thing going up. Tell me about that day. On that day we were working on the ships. There are in total four decks. So they have big they have big ladders going up to go to the top floor. Now, first we saw a big flitz, like two cranes that goes up and down from left to right to bring the sheet metal and all the equipment that we need. They often hit each other and you got a flash, electric flash. So we thought that that was the case. But when that did happen, we feel a hot, uh, like hot wind down here under the decks. And then, boom, like a bomb was fell down right on side of the ship where we were working. So everybody panicked, went to get upstairs. People are climbing up the ladder and the one behind them pull them down and get thrown on the floor. That's the way it was to get out of the ship and then run to the shelter. And then we saw that smoke when we were looking up. We said, we don't know what that room is. I wonder what the heck is going on. We hear the planes up and down. So we went to the shelter and we stay in the shelter and we look at them. What the heck is going on? And then finally later in the day, in the afternoon, the ferry boat come back in with people. These people are burned black. We could not understand what was happening. We don't, we don't know about the atom bomb. Those are the people that were there and were working there when the atom bomb exploded. It's just re re think how many people has been affected by that. They don't know either what, what is causing that. And then the next day, no, today, no she go to, that means, vandaag hoeven we niet te werken. It's prayer's day, a day to pray, pray. The Japanese camp commander. Today is a day to pray. We don't work today. Not knowing that they all know they are capitulating, capitulating, you know. And the second day, we were all called to in the front of the camp, and the uh, American, the English commander from the people that are there, prisoners, and the camp commander from the Jap, stood there and the Japanese camp commander said, well, we have decided to quit the war. Not to lose the war, but to quit the war. That's what he was told. We have decided to quit the war. 
and all the Japanese guards turn in their guns. The guards around the camp turn the turn their guns in. And that's how we know that Japan lost the war. So what happened to you and the rest of the prisoners? Well, you just can go out. You can go get better food. They have some pigs in the in the pixel in the back. All those pigs get slaughtered and good food for serves and what the heck is going on? So, after so many weeks, the uh, Chenango, American ship, went, came to Nagasaki, and we all went on the PT boat to Nagasaki, where we were inspected, everything, that we have not been affected by uh, radios, radios, radios. <clears throat> and they put us on the Chenango. It is a feeling I never forget. After all the misery from three and a half years, come on a ship, the deck comes up, the deck comes up, a band was on the deck, and play beautiful music. We do not know what comes over us. And then the first meal that we have served, it is just like you're in paradise. You know. So from there, <clears throat> they take us, uh, thank the, was Okinawa, I think. Yeah. They took us to Okinawa. And then after that, we were flown over to another place. And from, from there, they take us over to the Philippines. And there we stayed several months, waiting for transportation, going back to Indonesia. And when they finally had a boat open from the Dutch to take us over to Indonesia, or to sell the syllabus where we were born, that's when we came back in the city where we were born. Yeah. That was something else. And by that time, in, instead of the Japanese, the kurgas, you know what the kurgas are? <laughs> Those are people like, uh, eh, I cannot prescribe, you can describe it. They, the kurgas are uh, from Singapore, from Singapore. They're Arabian people, <clears throat> but it's a special tribe, and they are on the British demand by that time. And they have been stationed in Indonesia. So they were so so called there to help us, keep keep an eye on us. That's the whole story. What advice do you want to give to future generations? To forget about the difference in race, in race, you know, and their belief. No matter what you are, you are a Mohammedan, you are a Christian, or you are Buddha, you all believe in one thing, only it has a different name. They call it Allah, they call it God. It's one 
creator that people don't try to put it in their mind. Why am I here? Who put me here? If they get up in the morning and they look out and they see these birds and they see these flowers, everything around, who made that? Not one person, not a people. The Almighty God made that. And people cannot believe it. And then, when you get older, there is one thing. I always try to get my followers and kids to remember. Don't ever fear. If you believe in the Almighty God, then there should not be fear because He will decide what is going to happen with you. You just have to be happy with it. If you were to give me some wisdom for my life, what would you tell me? That is what I'm going to tell you. But based, so, on, so, ba so, based on your experiences still, in World War II, what would you tell me? One thing I will tell you. One thing you keep in mind and you keep in your heart that you cannot hate. You cannot hate. If you have love for each other, then you will be a complete different person. If you are approached by somebody with a smile and, and, look, and, and look in your eyes, are you going to hate somebody like that? Honestly, you won't, right? If somebody say to you, thank you, would you accept it or not? You accept it. You know? You always have one thing. You always have to be humble. Humble. Which a lot of people cannot be, no matter what. They don't have it in. They don't feel it. What it is to be humble. But that is the only thing that gives you rest in your life and live in peace. This is what I found out all these years that I went through in my life. What do you want to say to all those men who were killed overseas in World War II? I cannot say anything about that. To me, that is their time. Because you wonder sometimes, if there is a God with love that has created you, why does he allow it? He has a reason for that. He has a reason for that. You know? But what would you want them to know? Like what? That's, like if you could talk to your cousin or your uncle, what what would you what would you want them to know? I I just want them to know. It is bad that they have not could live the way they want to live. It is their time, and they can do nothing about it. Nothing. I can sit here talking to you, but if my God say, well, you know what, George? You have served your purpose. It's your time. I go with a smile. I'm glad because I know I go back to my Creator. That's the way I'm feeling after all these years. 
Are you afraid of death? No. Because? I'm not afraid of death. That I say, you cannot live in fear. If you are afraid of death, you are living in fear. That means you don't believe. That, that's what I always try to make people understand. So what do you believe happens after someone dies? After someone dies? If they have asked the Lord for forgiveness, they will be happy. They will be back to Him and they have no sorrows anymore, no pain or anything. How do you want to be remembered? As a person that is happy and humble and loving. That's why, that's the way I will be remembered. So, the, the, the name of the thing is the has Rauten, Rautenbach. Rautenbach is the name of the head of the brigade that they have. So I know nobody from that group came out alive. What would you do to pass the time on the ship over to Japan? Nothing else, just sitting there, doing crazy things, like making, putting tattoos on people's shoulders. You got that tattoo? Yeah. On the ship? On the ship. No. Yes, it's a regular needle and Chinese, and Chinese ink. What's it say? Rika. Rika, that's the name of the girl that I did promise. I, I promised her to marry her and that I will back, be back. But what is it? It's a heart? A heart and a cross. You got that on the way over to Japan? Japan, yes. Because I want, that, that I think kept me alive in person camp because I make a promise. Don't worry, I will come back and marry you. See? And if I, make, if I make a promise, I hate to break a, I hate to break a promise. So, on the ship, everybody put tattoos on their body, and I want this tattoo to remind me to her, it's her name on it. But then, after the war was over, and I came back to the celibus, and the boat anchored, and all the friends came aboard, I look around, I don't see her. So I asked one of the boys, hey, where is Rika? Then they kind of not wanting to tell me. When I finally came out, she has been married. I said, what? I was very mad. But later, 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 I start thinking. If I didn't have this here to remind me of my promise, I wouldn't have been fighting that during prison camp. That kept me going. I promised that I come back, so I will come back. That I've been praying for, and that kept me going to stay alive. Now, in a way, I'm right now. I'm thankful that 
This is the way it has been. Although, although I have been so mad for a long time, but it's not meant to be. Talk to me about how, how dirty you were in the camp. Well, once a week, we could go and take a sponge bath. I call it a sponge bath. You take a little towel, a little soap, and you wipe yourself off. A whole array of, a whole line of people. There are so many people at one time. This is in Japan? That's in Japan. And the restrooms are one long thing. You do your dropping in a stream of water and it is going to a big container where it will sit and the Japanese use that for their farm. <laughs> they use that for the farm. <laughs> the droppings. Did anyone die in the prison camp in Indonesia? No. None of them. So well, at the time that I was being that I had been there, no one. So the only camps you were in was the military camp in Indonesia? Indonesia. And the one in Japan. Just the, those two? Uh, two camps. And then after the war was over, they were bringing us to Nagasaki, they brought us to the Philippines, Okinawa, all, all camps, all military. So, did anyone die in the prison camp in Japan? In Japan, yes, yeah, several. I would say all together, maybe seven, eight or nine people died in prison camp. How many men were there in total? Megapan? What was the total population of the camp? In our area, I was number 784. Uh, the barracks were in the rural area has about 900 people. So out of 900, only nine died? Yeah, of our side. I don't know, on the other side, you know, the British and Australian, but that wouldn't be, wouldn't be much. And the ones who died, did they die from... Uh, Malnourishment, not enough food, and sickness. Did sickness they, with no medication. Did you ever see the Japanese beat anyone? Oh, yeah. Tell me about the beatings that you witnessed. It is unbelievable. They waited with the, how you call this thing? It is a manila robe beating with a long stick, you know, and I used that to beat them. And quite so many times, you see the lines that have been beating, sometimes, sometimes you see them bleeding, that I get beating, you know. Or with the, uh, the gun, the, Smack the guns on your chest or on your back. Did they ever force other prisoners to hit other prisoners? No. No, they did not. What kind of things would someone do to get a punishment from the Japanese guards? Well, if they don't understand them, they get a punishment. They don't do what the Japanese want them to do because they do not know what they want them to do. See? And that is, or if they get, if they get caught smoking, asking, who, who give it to you? 
If somebody did something and expected somebody to smuggle to them, then they beat be the hell out of you. you know? But that, that's what they did. Because they, they need people to work for them. They, they don't, in Japan, they won't really beat you that much that, much that you cannot do your job for them. You know? How many beatings did you receive? Uh, in the Celebes, I have had one beating and my face, slept on my face, left and right. And in Japan, I had one thing that they, they hit my head back with the shoulder, during the call of their gun, you know. I said, I said, because I tried as fast as I can to learn to understand what they want. You know? After you were liberated, or the war, you know, the, the war ended, uh, August, did mm -hmm. the prisoners, did some of them take it out on the Japanese guards? Oh, yes. Tell me about the revenge that the prisoners... That, that is what I have been hearing, okay? I was not with them. Oh, you never saw it? No, I never saw it, but that I have been hearing. What did you hear? That they went after, after these guys to find where they are. And either they killed them or they gave them a bad beating, I don't know. But they found these guys, and some of them had, I know had been killed. The one that had been fairly brutalized people that much, you know, had been killed. That's why the camp commander wait three days to let us know, three or four days to let us know that the war was over so that they have a chance to get away. They did have a chance to get away. But when the war was over, they walked in this little village there, the Japanese officers, they bowed their head and somebody offered their sword, their sword. See? They knew that the law so they offered their swords. So that was a big difference. How would and, and the Japanese inhabit inhabitants from outside, they were okay to us. They're not hating or anything. How would you get your news inside the camp? My what? My news. Your news. No news. Because no radio, no nothing. Hardly nothing. Once in a while, somebody gets smoke on a piece of paper, but it's all in Japanese. Nothing is in English there. Nothing is in English. That's the reason we do not know what's going on in the world. When Red Cross sent packages for the prisoners, we hardly see anything of it. The Japanese, Guards, they are enjoying it. You get one box, you have to divide with four or five people. One box from the Red Cross to have divided. I know one thing, one prisoner after the war, there was so much food, so much boxes were given out, he ate himself. He ate himself to death. He died. You saw that? Yeah, that's an our camp, in our barracks. He died from eating too much. I don't know how. How that can happen? I don't know. If that's the cause, I don't know. But he was dead. Would, so the, we, would the prisoners fight one another for food? Sometimes. What do you remember about that? 
I remember one thing, a friend of mine, his death was also in prison. Okay, he was an older man. And we find out that a young, healthy guy, they stole his food. And I was so mad that the fa father of my good friend, Blumenstein, had to beat the hell out of the guy. I beat the hell out of the guy. I was so mad. Why he has to steal food from an older man? And that man died, the older no, man? No, he didn't die. Later on, when we were home, yes, he died. And he, his son died later on when I was away from Indonesia already. But that's the only time oh, so, that I beat so, somebody so, so, that bad. So this young man stole food from your older, from this older man? Yeah, from the... But the older man didn't die? No, no, okay. no. He only stole the food. And okay. that made me so mad. What did you do to him? I beat the hell out of him. Wherever I could hit him, they had to take me off of him, you know. Did he ever steal again? Oh, yeah. He stole again? Oh, yeah, because that was during we were still in camp. We were still in the camp when that happened. But the guy who you beat up, he stole food again? No. That's what I meant, yeah. No. That, that probably that teach him. Mm. See, and it's probably shameful, everybody knows why, why I have, why I have given him that beating, you know? Did the Japanese guards ever sneak anything into the camp for the prisoners? No, never, never. They never get anything to the prisoners in camp. Outsiders, if they have a chance during the work, you go to the restroom and you have to get the material and the guy says, shh, 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 and give you half a stump, half a stump of a cigarette to finish, you know. And like I say, some women, they come by and smoke on some food for us, or a tomato, tomato or a piece of fruit and give it to us while nobody's around. And when they get caught, they get a beating of their life. But then one person has been away for several days because of the beating they had. But a couple of days after that, she starts doing it again, again. So that, that shows you they are not all that bad. There are some people among them that are good. When you were looking down at the Japanese and you were firing, yeah. when you're, you didn't know your uncle was killed at that time. Oh, he was killed already. My uncle, oh, my younger uncle, I didn't know that. But later on you found out he yeah, was Yeah, I found there. out. He was there. He was there, you know, okay. because after the war, the news came out, the whole brigade from them had been completely killed. Was that the only time you fired your rifle? Oh. That incident? That incident long, yeah. That incident and when they first, and when they first came underneath the cornfield, you know. I thought machine guns fired it. Machine guns too, but we firing too with the rifles. So those were the only two times you fired? Yeah. Is that right? All right. So otherwise, you were on your motor on the on the road going from one place to the other place. Usually, what was the distance you would travel? Oh, there were between ten and twenty-five miles. And would you give written letters, or it's all no. verbal? Written letters and some verbal, but most of them are written letters written levels from one command office to the other command office. 
Sí. When you, when you all decided to surrender yourselves, where did you put all your weapons? We ha when we surrender, we have to hand it over. We have to hand it over to them. We have to hand their guns over and everything. Were there any specific times that you really thought to yourself you weren't going to make it? Hmm. Well, there are some times, but as I said... Like what? I have one thing in mind. I have to get out alive out of this. But, but, but what do you remember about those times? Those times is bad. I think of my my parents, my brothers and sisters, you know. I say, why, why am I here? Why am I doing this? You know. That's a big question mark, why? Especially as you're young, you know. You didn't really know what life has been and what is supposed to be. The Japanese who were coming over the cornfield, yeah. did they come? Cl did they end up coming close or no? No, no, because they came up and we pulled back. We pulled back to the to the hills and to. How much weight did you lose when you were a prisoner? Oh, I, a lot. What were you originally? Originally, I was 168, 169. And then at the end of the war, what were you? I was bones in the back. You know what I mean? Bones in the back. You hardly can see any meat. Only bones. It is so bad in the winter, we only get, ever since we arrived there, they get one old army coat. And we went through all the winter with that. So when you walk to the shipyard and you see a piece of cardboard and the guard, the guard is not watching, you pick it up and hide it under your coat because you use that as your underwear. Cardboard? Cardboard newspaper, but you make sure they don't see it because they're going to beat you to death. <laughs> because they don't want that. See, you hide it under your coat, under your clothing. Did you have to work at the shipyard every day? Every day, except for Sunday. And how long were the days? We have to leave the camp around 6 o'clock in the morning and sleep the work at about 6 o'clock, 12 days, 12 hours a day. Do you get breaks? Oh yeah, you get lunch break. That's about it. A typical day? What would you be given for breakfast? As I told you, that soup and a little bowl of, a little bowl of rice and that is breakfast. Lunch? Lunch, the same thing. Bowl of rice and a piece of dry fish of dry meat. Dinner? Same thing. Either dry vegetables, there's a bowl of soup and a bowl of rice. Were there oftentimes bugs in your food? No. We don't even look. We are too hungry. How, 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 how do you get your water? Oh, from them. They was, supply the water, you know. Clean water? They have one, one line of water coming in there. That's where we get the water. Did from. you get lice? No, I never did. You get never it. got No. Uh -uh. Your cousin died in the same area as you. In the sick bay. But he worked on the ships with you. Yeah. What was his name? Albert. And your uncle, what was his name? Lodovic. So, your cousin, did you visit him in the sick bay? Yes, I did. Several times. What, what was his ailment? He had pneumonia too. 
me murió. But as I said, I think he died from uh, not nutrition in his body, since he doesn't want to keep any food, and he has not the will. Were you do. Were you with him when he died? No, I was. The next day, they told me, "Hey, he's died. He died." He was your first cousin. Uh, my first cousin. When my he... uncle was the first one that died, and he was my cousin that died. And the other cousin, a really young uncle, because he's just several years older than I am, he died in that group that had been wiped up with the Japanese. When you came home, you had to tell the family what happened to your cousin. Yeah, except for what happened to my young uncle, because we didn't know what is happening. Until after the war was over, we did, we did hear that his whole section has been wiped out. But what, what was that like to tell your family about your cousin? We didn't tell him, uh, tell her, my family. We knows, but his mother, we didn't tell his mother. So what did she think happened? One of the... Uh, Family kids that hear the news of the brigade was completely wiped out. And my grandmother was still hoping, hoping every day. Oh, when is coming back? When is coming back? And she finally got to hear that his whole brigade had been wiped out. So when you were in the Japanese prison, did you ever talk with the American or the British prisoners? Or oh yeah, oh yeah. That's why I but, picked... But, but are you all in the same camp? All in the same camp. Did So if you wanted to... Me, peace of each other, yes. No fence, but between no, you? Between us. Did mostly, did the different nations stick to themselves or did you guys interact? I, I usually stick to themselves, you know. That's the other side. And we understand. But that, you talk to them at work and all that, that's why you pick up some English, you know, pick up some English. Do you know, how many ships did you help create? Oh, oh, for those years, we have one, two, we have three dogs. Three, four, I would say maybe nine or ten or eleven ships. From the, the surface, from the ground from up. the ground up were these warships or cargo ships these are cargo ships cargo ships okay. was the japanese city was it destroyed or no the city no no the place where we nagasaki was completely gone you saw it oh yeah because and then over there to bring my cousin to be, be burned, okay? It's nice, it was on the hill, come to the sea. That is completely flat going down to the ocean. Those iron poles, lantern poles, all that, is all melted on the floor. Nothing stood up. Because after that war, we, they took us to Nagasaki to be inspected and for all the stuff, you know, before they take us on board on the Chenango. Can you tell me some more about what the fighting was like on Java? On Java? I mean... The, the Japanese, they oh. invaded Java. Yeah, they invaded Java, but I do not know much because they are fighting on, on the island of Java. You were on Java? No, I am the Celebes. Celebes? Yeah, you got Japan, Japan is on top, and then south of them is the Philippines, and south of the Philippines is where Indonesia starts. New Guinea is half 
English and half Dutch. That island yeah, comes yeah. two parts. And then they come down to Indonesia. Indonesia in reality consists consists out of thousand islands. So the main islands are Java, uh, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, the Celebes, and Bali. That, those are the m main big islands. So you were only on the Celebes? The Celebes. And I went during the war only in the Celebes. On, on the, and the Celebes, yeah. 